If one thinks about the ASLA as the conductor of an orchestra, we as practitioners are perhaps the composers. Through its 100-year history, ASLA stands for uh, you know, the profession that represents the importance of public open space and that every community has a town green. Central Park represented the founding of the profession. There were two women, uh, two prominent women, Beatrice Farrand and Marion Coffin, who were both part of the founding group of the organization. Beatrix Farrand was a founding member of the ASLA and the New York chapter, and you know she's part of this wonderful cohort of women at the time who were much involved in, in landscape design. They really didn't call themselves landscape architects. Look at her work, the great landscapes in the United States. Not much happens in the first decades of the 20th century. Really, things begin happening with Robert Moses in the 30s, with LaGuardia. The Great Lawn is one of the kind of quintessential Central Park landscapes, and it's not an Olmstedian landscape. It was originally a masonry reservoir, and ASLA promulgated a plan. Moses certainly had his particular style that came out of Gilmore Clark and Clark and Rapawano. Having worked at Clark and Rapawano when I first got out of graduate school and came up to New York, and to have the opportunity to work with some of the last members of the staff that was there when Gilmore Clark and Mike Rapuano made that into the firm that really transformed the New York City landscape, probably as much as anybody as Olmsted did. They came in and because Gilmore Clark was good friends with Robert Moses, you'd go through the old flat file drawers and see these beautiful ink on linen drawings of Battery Park, Robert Moses State Park, the UN, Jones Beach, Bryant Park, Riverside Park, an endless array of what you think of the great landscapes of New York were generated by that firm of Clark and Rapuanos. In the 1960s, there's, there's really a focus on the needs of children in cities. Particularly focusing on playgrounds with uh, and Paul Friedberg and Richard Datner. Uh, there's the Adventure Playground. The early playgrounds in this city looked like machines. It kept that way because we, as a culture, didn't want to spend money on kids. Okay? And we therefore created playgrounds that required no supervision. They were you, were, you were let loose in this environment, and you had the choice of going up the stairs, down the slide, or you could go up the stairs and down the slide. And we created an environment where the slide became part of it, and you could access it from 360 degrees or not. The getting there was as important as the being there. During the 60s, I created something called Timber Form, and where we actually had timbers, 12 inches by 12 inches by different heights, and we bolted them together. I began to watch kids, and I realized that it's not the playground that's important, it's play. Our major effort was in the children's zoo, and we wanted, everybody wanted to make that a very different place. It requires that, that level of storytelling imagination that I think the best children's landscapes have. By the latter part of the 1960s, well into the 1970s, there was a serious decline in the state of public parks, basically at the, at the verge of being almost completely lost. And there was a, you know, a number of different kind of citizen-led groups that advocated for the importance of public space across the city, which ultimately led to the foundation of the Central Park Conservancy. It's a very interesting arrangement because, of course, the park is still owned by the city, which is the public sector, but these private sector people are raising money to create a standard that the public sector is just not capable of doing. Not just Central Park Conservancy or the Prospect Park Alliance, but there's such things as a Madison Square Alliance. The most recent one, of course, is the High Line. Everyone wants to talk about the High Line and or Governor's Island, quite frankly, because there's a Governor's Island Trust. And then coming out of the success of those types of organizations, I think you see much of the park's development you see coming into the 1990s, into the turn of the century, um, represents a different model. The Battery is the Battery Parks Conservancy, uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park, there's the Hudson River Park, Riverside Park. Paley Park, another one. Private money. Union Square, the physical improvements that the Parks Department did here, was a catalyst for related building, their building here. It was a catalyst for the improvement of Union Square. And then with the green market coming into Union Square, I mean, the green market in Union Square, I mean, I see school groups here, I see tourists here. I mean, it's like people come here and it's like they're in Paris. 
I mean, that's what makes New York great. It's what makes Union Square great. But without the physical improvements made to the Union Square Park, the rest of the development around Union Square would not have happened as it did. Fixing up parks always, always is good for a local economy. The real estate values around Central Park are astronomical because of the park. The real estate values once the High Line was put in just skyrocketed. It cuts the other way too, which is, you know, we've been working on flood protection projects for the East River, and the community there is afraid of a world-class park design in East River Park because they don't want their community to gentrify. They don't want to be displaced from their communities. Parks are infrastructure as much as water mains, um, firehouses and schools. They're infrastructure in terms of how we use them, but they're also infrastructure in terms of how they tie the storm drainage, the kind of green component. And today's park development really recognizes how parks fit into that more than ever before. You know, we're, we're, in a, we're at the crossroads, we're in this really challenging time right now because we need these ecological solutions to address climate change. And when you start to put gardens on the street that absorb stormwater and you start to reconfigure the shoreline in a way that can prevent surge from coming into the city, those landscapes have to be maintained. They're not just pretty gardens, they're actually working, infra they're actually infrastructure. We have to think outside of the box. And we should be the ones advocating as landscape architects, because that's our province. This organization stands for understanding that landscape architects have a major role in making cities livable. When I first started working in New York in the late 60s, Landscape architects could not sign a contract with the park department. You uh, had to either be a landscape architect in an engineering firm, or you had to have an alliance with an architect or an engineer in order to practice. Part of what the ASLA would advocate for is for the authority of landscape architects to practice as prime practitioners. The moment for landscape architects had come and that you know we were starting to lead the projects that people were talking about you know i was traveling a lot and people were asking about the high line before that people were asking about central park people are also asking about governor's island soon they're going to be asking about the cool flood protection projects around the shorelines how we're recovering from sandy hurricane sandy really tested us and the asla responded and our firm responded we have participated in HUD's Rebuild by Design competition. We studied all of the aspects, all of the layers that went into what happened so that we could try to think about ways of helping to mitigate that effect in the future. When requests for proposals are put out by uh, a municipality, they often identify who they want to respond to this as the lead firm. And it used to be almost exclusively architects and engineers. And now landscape architects are listed as one of the uh, prime respondents. And I'm sure it has to do with the collaborative effort of the recognition of our profession, which ASLA has had a great deal to, to do. The chapter does a much better job of that now because of the diversity of programs and the experiences and the, the socialization and the educational programs that the chapter provides. That's, the chapter's really done a great job in the last decade growing into that. And I see that even more now that it gets better and better every year. It has better leadership, it has executive directors, it has funding, which allows us to provide more services for our members. It allows this chapter to grow academically, socially, intellectually, it allows us to interface with other design professionals and I think that's of great value. It's really about commitment to the future of the profession. It's all about networking. ASLA has so many events that bring everybody together and everybody just talks with everybody and, and it's, it's really wonderful. We have the open studios that uh, bring young people in particular right into the offices and we can, we can chat in our, in our own spaces. The most rewarding thing for me is you meet some really incredible people and you really get a collaboration. It allows us to interface with other design professionals and I think that's of great value. And it allows for, for young landscape architects and students to learn from those who have gone before them. One of the great joys of being a landscape architect is this is not a profession of what you do, it's who you are. 
You know, you're not you're not going to work. It's really who you are. You're a landscape architect, and that starts in your soul and comes out through your hands, and is, you know, the vi you you see the result of that in the work that you do, and I think we're we're very lucky in some ways to be able to have a, a profession and a career that is of who we are. It's like a great musician. Musicians don't go to work; they create music. Landscape architects don't go to work; we create landscapes. We are the ones who are the stewards of the environment. The notion of stewardship is something that I think has been very much part of the ASLA for decades. If indeed we want to move beyond private funding of public parkland and public open space, stewardship is essential. And that I think comes through education uh, and that is something that uh, I think ASLA has done and can perhaps do more if we could begin to get this notion of stewardship embedded in our school system. This I think is really going to be a critical way that we can ensure that our public landscapes are protected.